Hello everyone, we are Senior Design Group 6. We are the 20 year core life extension for load following sodium cooled fast reactors. Our ac academic advisors were Dr. Scott Palmtag, Dr. David Kirkpatrick, and our industry advisor was Dr. Eric Lowen. My name is Brandon Tung. I'm Will Murray. I'm Dale Claymont. Garrett Riggs. And I'm Kodo Yoshizaki. So the reactor that our project was based around was the PRISM reactor designed by GE Hitachi. It stands for the Power Reactor Innovative Small Modular, and as its name suggests, it's a small modular reactor that is sodium cooled and is a fast reactor, originally designed for a fuel cycle of two years. Um, here we have a little cross section here. We'll go over the design of it. It is hexagonal in nature. The Outermost ring is our shielding layer, which is made of boron carbide assemblies. Next, we have two layers of reflecting materials, which are assemblies of solid HT9 stainless steel rods. Then we have our outer fuel zone, which is composed of 10% uranium zirconium alloyed fuel, followed by an inner fuel zone, which is of the same material, but just varying enrichments. Then we have our control assemblies with control rods and ultimate shutdown rods made of boron carbide and gas expansion modules, which are filled with pressurized argon gas so that in the event of a loss of coolant flow accident, they can insert negative reactivity. So part of our project was to compare PRISM to its com main competitor, the ARC-100 reactor. Uh, both reactors are sodium cooled, use uranium zirconium alloyed fuel, have fairly similar fuel alloy masses, the difference, though, is that PRISM was designed for a two-year fuel cycle at 840 megawatts, while the ARC-100 was designed for a 20-year fuel cycle at 260 megawatts. So our objective became to design a 20-year fuel cycle for the PRISM so that, it can be, so that it can compete with the ARC-100. To model our core, we used a handful of codes from Argonne National Labs. Namely, we used MCC to develop our material cross-sections. We used DIF3D to model diffusion throughout the reactor, and Rebus was used to model our fuel depletion over time. We also used VISIT to create 3D flux maps. On the left here, we have one made from our manual core design, and on the right, we have one from our automated core design, which I'll go over in a second. We used two design methods, both using 1.6 core symmetry and one was our manual design, and one was an optimization algorithm. The differences are shown here, but it came down to the manual design was fairly tedious. We handpicked different uh, enrichment assemblies and put them over the location, different locations and would run them, and the optimization algorithm was a bit more autonomous and made a bunch of changes on its own and continued to run th through them. Now I'll hand it over to Garrett. All right. So one of our constraints for our reactor is that our fuel depletion and our swelling on our HT9 stainless steel cladding and canning around our assemblies has to be limited. And so we had a correlation for our burn up to the exposure to the cladding and our cans as well. So we used an average burn up of 100 gigawatt days per metric ton uranium in all of our assemblies as just a core wide average for our limit. And this correlated to just some number of DPAs that is safe for our cladding and our canning that we knew would not expand it too much and put us out of our material limits. So to calculate our burnup, we took power times time divided by the fuel mass in the core, and that gives you a rough number of our burnup. And with our project being shot or aiming for 20 years, and our fuel mass at 20 metric tons, and that's fixed by our core geometry, we got an average burnup of 100 gigawatt days for our limit, and that limited our power. And so our plot here shows the kind of lifespan you can expect from the core for a given power that you're operating at. And at 840 megawatts, which is what it was designed for, we can operate around six years. Uh, this is reduced to about 240 megawatts thermal for a 20 year core lifespan. And then when we compared this to the ARC-100, we saw that ARC-100 had about a 92 gigawatt day per metric ton uranium burn up limit. So we tested cores manually. This was kind of how we started the project and was where most of our work came in. And uh, doing this, we found that our criticality requirements were actually another really big limiting factor and that most of our core designs could not last 20 years and so uh, our main idea was basically cram as much highly enriched uranium into the core as we can with our limit at 20% uranium-235. Um, all of the cores that we designed by hand 
kind of relied on an annular design, which is what most <laughs> reactor cores use. And this was kind of an intuitive way to do it, where we could use lower enriched fuel in the center to reduce our maximum peaking, and then higher enriched fuel on the outside to increase our lifespan. This plot shows a summary of our core results. The dots along the bottom indicate where each core lies on our testing, with um, the cores on the bottom left usually had the least amount of enriched uranium, and the cores on the bottom right had the highest enrichment of uranium. The core that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen is what we ended up using and had a 17.5% uranium-235 core with 20% uranium uh, surrounding it, and on the top and bottom is actually a 20% enriched blanket as well. So this had a core average enrichment of 19.9% and allowed us to hit our 20-year limit without violating our burn-up. And we actually ended up using a greater burn-up in the center of the core for our highest peaking uh, assemblies. And uh, one thing that our simulation codes did that we ran was it tracked our uh, concentration of each isotope in the core. So here we have our two different enrichment levels and the isotopes uh, associated with them. We only have the uranium and plutonium shown that we were interested in. And this was actually really helpful in debugging our code initially because one of the problems we ran into was that our K-effective was monotonically increasing, which we knew was just wrong because we weren't breeding that much uranium or plutonium or any other fuel. So our uh, issue was obviously that something was not depleting how it should. And when we looked at these plots, our uranium-235 was pretty much constant. It just would only deplete from non-fission reactions, which was odd considering we were still getting fission product buildup and we were getting power out of the reactor. So that was actually just an issue with our code that once we fixed it, it started actually uh, tracking our depletion how it's supposed to. And this was just a very handy debugging tool because we kind of knew how to expect each isotope to change throughout the life of the reactor. And this was kind of what we used to gauge whether or not we were going in the right direction. And so one other thing that we were testing was the ARP100 configuration. So their highest uh, enrichment is 17.2 weight percent, which is lower than our lowest. And when we put that into our core, we also took some liberties to add more highly enriched fuel than they used. In their plot, they have one ring of highly enriched fuel. We used about four. And we were still subcritical at our initial load with all rods out, so we're not really sure how the ARC-100 is capable of reaching 260 megawatts with 20 years. Um, maybe that's a design that they're promising, but they actually can't guarantee it yet. We're not really sure. That would require further testing, and with more time, we would maybe be able to uh, create their core in our Rebus simulations, but as of now, it's not something we could get to. I'll hand it over to Kotaro. Thank you, Garrett. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, we have developed a optimization code um, in Fortran to help us find the core that meets all the requirements. So what the code does is that it initially generates a random, a completely random core, and it um, applies the simulated annealing algorithm to help us find, to minimize burn up and maximize K effective, as shown in the figure. So some information about the simulated annealing algorithm. <coughs> so you, you, you define a, an objective function, F, based on the burn up and the K effective in which you would like to minimize. <coughs> so you propose a random change to the randomly generated core and you calculate this F value. And if, it's, if the F value gets smaller, you accept the change. If it gets larger, you accept based on a probability. And you repeat this process for <coughs> an arbitrary number of times until it converges. So the figure on the top is the F normalized F values. Um, you can see that it is decreasing, converging to a lower value, meaning that the code works. And also the acceptance ratio also gets smaller, meaning that the code gets more selective as the iterations progress. So this is our objective function. It's a function of peak power density and K effective. Um, the coefficient, coefficient C1 and C2 we can change arbitrarily based on the amount of weight we want to put on, put on each variable. The control parameter is T. Um, you decrease it uh, with, over the iterations so that the acceptance ratio gets smaller and the program gets more selective. Now we use the peak power density instead of peak burnup um, since they first, first they correlate well, and second, um, while the peak burnup takes about a minute to run to calculate, um, the power density takes only about 10 seconds, and <coughs> we want to save as much time as possible. Uh, so for the code, we can also specify the number of um, 
different image assemblies. Um, these are just all the uh, cases we ran, the results we've obtained. The label represents the low, medium, and high rich assemblies, um, and the number of each assembly per one six symmetry. So this, this algorithm, um, we, we <coughs> put the results of the manually uh, generated cores to this algorithm to see if it makes it any better. Um, turns out it extends the life, as you can see, they're all about uh, 19, 20 years, but it also increases the burn up. Um, this is due to the, uh, how we define our objective function. Now I'll hand it over to Will. Thank you, Kotaro. So we started with an 840 megawatt core, and then to get it to 20 years, we had to decrease the power to 144 megawatts. So this gives us a lot of excess thermal or thermal hydraulic capacity. So what we decided to do with this excess thermal capacity is attempt to do load following. So the main motivation for load following is that suitable that solar photovoltaic is cutting into base load electricity demand in the middle of the day. The figure you see on the screen is done by a study that shows the potential effect of solar on the effect of midday um, energy demand. So this causes two big problems. One is that for the nuclear power plants that provide base load electricity generation, this cuts into their profit. The other issue this creates is a grid resiliency issue. So you see that at about 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., you need a ramp-up rate of about 13,000 megawatts in this study. And these can only be met by dispatchable energy sources such as natural gas or hydroelectric power. So what we wanted to figure out was can we modify this 20-year core to meet this ramp-up rate? And the answer is that we can. So Dr. Lowen gave us a maximum ramp-up rate for the prism. And the ramp-up rate you see between 4 and 7 on this graph uh, 4 and 7 p.m. rather, uh, is less than this maximum. And you can see that as long as we do the load following such that the daily average is below 144 megawatts, this core will also last for 20 years. <coughs> so something that's, that should be obvious is that if you operate at a higher power, you will deplete your fuel faster. And so we ran our core at three different powers, and you can see based on fuel depletion rates, that higher powers will deplete the fuel much faster. The original design was at 840 megawatts, and just based on fuel depletion, it would only last 3.5 years. If you remember back from our HT9 graph, um, we would hit our material limit in six years, so we found that the fuel was more limiting than the material limit. Um, if you operate 144, you reach the 20-year goal, and let's say you have more energy sources coming in and they disrupt your market, so you have to operate at a lower power, um, that just means you can operate the reactor for a longer period of time. <clears throat> so one of the technical constraints with load following is that you don't want to break your materials due to the thermal cyclic stresses induced by turning the power up and down. So the thermal stress can be defined as the coefficient of thermal expansion times the modulus of elasticity times the temperature change associated with the change in power. We took a change in power to be from 100 megawatts to 840 megawatts in the maximum case. And this yielded a temperature change of about uh, 200 Kelvin after our thermal hydraulic calculations. We also said that you would apply the stress two times per day. You would go up in power once and then down in power once to meet the peak energy demand. The, when you apply the stress two times per day, every day for 20 years, you have the number of stresses applied at 4.4 times 10 to the fourth. When you multiply all these numbers together, you get a thermal cyclic stress of 115 megapascals. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, it's very hard to find data for HT9. There's a lot of data for stainless steel 316, which is used in uh, light water reactors. So since we figured that HT9 is closely related to stainless steel 316, we would use that as a surrogate for materials data. We found based on the study, or we found based on a study that the limits for stainless steel 316 and LWRs would be at 260 megapascals, but the HT9 that we would do for load following in PRISM only has a maximum at 115 megapascals. For us, this means that we do not expect the HT9 cladding to fail 
based on the expansion. Um, we did not do a full materials analysis. We did not have the chance to look at the uranium zirconium metal analysis. We did a simple model for the HD9. Now I'll pass it over to Dale, who will talk about the economics of prison. Thanks, Will. Uh, the largest controllable cost in our design is the average enrichment. And for our best manual core and uh, optimized core is right around 20% enrichment. And at that enrichment, and the total cost of enrichment will be right around $33 million. We plan on selling our electricity at 25 cent per kilowatt hour. And that will give us a operational cost of around 500 million and a total revenue of approximately 2.33 billion, which will result in a net profit of 1.78 billion minus the construction costs. You may be thinking to yourself, why are we selling electricity at such high rates? And that is due to the fact that our target audience is in remote locations. One location that we considered was Bethel, Alaska. Bethel, Alaska is not connected to any major oil pipeline in Alaska and is not connected to any major roadways and is only accessible by air or by water. So that results in a extremely high electricity rate, which is currently at 56.1 cent per kilowatt hour, which is a little more than 40 cent more than the national average, which is at 10 cent. Uh, with PRISM operating at 144 megawatt hour, we can supply roughly half of Bethel with electricity. And this will result in possibly an increase in electricity usage and also a decrease in the total cost of electricity in the area. More information on Bethel, Alaska. Uh, it obtains most of its energy from diesel gas generators. Uh, it has a growth rate of approximately 1.1% per year. And it's actually the taxi cab capital of the United States due to the fact that it has more taxis per capita than any other area. Uh, to sum it up, we're still unclear of how the ARC 100 reaches 20 years at 260 megawatts. For both our manual and our optimized code, I mean, um, core design, they both operated at 144 megawatts at 20 years, with the manual design having an average enrichment of 19.9%, and the optimized design having an enrichment of 19.75%. Any questions? So the fuel costs were assessed by calculating the SWU necessary in order to reach enrichment. Um, Prism used UZR fuel, which is made of metal slugs, and we could not find uh, manufacturing information on that. We could only find that on UO2 pellets. So we decided to only model the cost as the cost of SWU enrichment. And then we found this, the local SWU prices, which I think was $37 per SWU, SWU kilogram. Um, and that's how we calculated the, the fuel costs. Uh, the optimization code, um, it randomly chooses two assemblies of different enrichments and it just swaps them. And that's one iteration. Well, um, initially uh, we did, uh, we had the coefficient for burn up to be about 2,000 and the coefficient of K effective to be, K effective to be around 2,000. And the resulting core didn't last 20 years, so we had to increase it until we got 20 years. You, you mentioned uh, the HD9 swelling of strength. Is your okay at 170 gigawatts? 
Uh, the limit we found was for an absolute max spread of 165 gigawatt days per metric ton, and the final manual design we used is below that. And so that's based on uh, actual experimental data that has shown that H9 can tolerate that level of exposure, or the equivalent DPAs from that level of exposure. Yes, sir. I'd like to clarify that 165 is the maximum peak burnup in our assembly. Uh, we set the average to be 100 gigawatt days per 100 yeah, gigawatt days per metric ton. First of all, thanks for a great talk. Uh, first question, or what, what question actually is, uh, you mentioned the load following as being one of the one of the benefits of this design, right? Yes. Um, how much is that an issue in Bethel, Alaska? I don't think they're going to have too many solar panels. I mean, just curious. So Bethel, Alaska would probably not be having as much solar panels. However, um, we wanted to have this load following capability as a design constraint so that we could force it into markets like California and Nevada where there's a lot of solar photovoltaic cells. Um, since if we can get that running, we think we could handle any load following done in Bethel, Alaska, which should have a constant power there. So at 25 cents per kilowatt hour, we are be better than the gas generators they're using. Um, that was 25 cents was set arbitrarily. Just, um, we did not try to compete with the national average for now. Okay. So.